I can't even begin to tell you how excited I am about the future and how much I love this church. I was, I was just overwhelmed this morning, just sitting here, not sitting, actually, we've been standing a lot this morning, standing here, singing and worshiping and thinking about the truths, thinking about the people that are here today, and I can't tell you how excited I am about what God's doing in this church. I'm thankful that God's given us a church that truly has a never stop spirit, and uh, we want to live with some unreasonable faith, and so a few weeks before the 50th anniversary, we were talking about, does anybody remember the big, big, hairy, audacious goals? And when we were talking about them and we were setting up and getting ready for our 50th anniversary, one of the things that has to be true of a big, audacious goal is that it has to be only 50% attainable. It has to be something that might happen, but might not be able to happen. And when I think about these goals, I think they definitely meet that criteria. I absolutely believe with all of my heart that God is more than able to help us not only accomplish those goals that we just laid out, but to do even more. But if that's going to happen and if that's going to take place, we have a responsibility to live with unreasonable faith. So does everybody have their bookmark? Everyone got that? You got it ready to go? I want you to take that out and I just want you to look at this one more time. I'm just going to rehash that. I know that video went quick. It was like a whirlwind, okay? So I just want to Walk through each one of these again, just by way of introduction. All right, over this next year, our prayer is that we would see 100 people get baptized. This is taking it a step further. Of course, we want to see people get saved. I'd love to see 100 people get saved, more than 100 people get saved. But this is also them being willing to take that next step and publicly profess their faith in Jesus. Now, that's a big goal. That would be by far the most that we've ever seen in one year at West Florida Baptist Church. But I know that it's attainable, especially if there's 100% participation. That means everybody plays a part in that. How many of you can invite people to church? How many of you believe that God wants you to be burdened about reaching people with the gospel of Jesus Christ? Hey, let's get burdened. Ask God to give you somebody, a neighbor, a coworker, a family member, somebody that's lost that needs to come to Jesus Take it personal. You go out and reach people. And if we do that, man, we can see God do an incredible work. All right, the second goal was a new auditorium in three to five years. I love it, man. I love it. I love seeing people come in late and they got to come all the way down to the front because we don't have a lot of room in here. We switched to two services back in 2020 because we were running out of room. And by the way, there still is more room in the second service. So if any of you start feeling uncomfortable, you can come to the second. There's a few more empty seats in that one. But having said all that, if we continue to grow the way that we have been, it's not going to be long before we're out of room in two services. And I can tell you in the next three to five years, especially if we see 100 people saved and baptized, we're going to need a new auditorium. I was driving down that nice new road. How many of you like that nice new road out there? Man, that's, that's been great. I was driving down that, and I was dreaming this morning about one day just seeing a nice new auditorium sitting over there for God's honor and for God's glory. It's possible. It's, it's, it's huge. The way the economy is today, it's not cheap to build. But I know this. Money is no option for our God. If we're doing our part, he'll provide. He will make a way. He'll do whatever is necessary to continue to advance his church. All right, number three. Are you ready for number three? Number three was... 1,500 people in attendance in five to 10 years. I want to stress and I want to reiterate, it is never just about numbers. We talk about numbers, okay? And we'll put numbers down on a, on a goal sheet about, like this, but it's not just about numbers, it's about people. Every single person is an individual. And when I think about our church, I think about you as individuals. I think about uh, the, how God's saving and transforming. I think about the way that God's working in hearts and in lives. I think about Santa Rosa County. Santa Rosa County's growing like crazy. There are thousands of people in this community, in Milton and Pace, Florida, thousands of people that don't know Jesus as their Savior, that need the truth of the gospel, that need the hope of Jesus Christ. And as our community's growing, we ought to desire to grow. I, I, I can't imagine a church that doesn't want to grow. How can we not? God's told us to go into all the world and reach the world, preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's our commission. 
And so those people are all about God continuing to save and transform. And there's nothing more exciting than seeing God moving and working in people's hearts and lives like that. And then number four. Okay, this is a 10-year goal. One and a half million dollars given to special missions projects. Now, the goal here is to more than double what we currently give towards missions. Right now, we give around $150,000 a year. And if you were to times that by 10, that would end up being $1.5 million. So what we want to do is obviously we want to continue. We support 64 missionaries right now all over the world. And we want to continue that support. And we want to see that grow and increase. But this is in addition to that. And this is for special projects for those missionaries that we already support to help meet some huge needs that they pray for and that they have so that they can continue to advance the gospel all around the world. And guess what? Next week, we are going to lay out project number one, the India project. And I'm not going to say anything more about it. You just got to come back next week. We'll lay out the vision and the goal there about how we can be used as a church to reach a very difficult and almost closed part of the world. And so stay tuned for that. That is coming up next week. You might be sitting here thinking this morning, why, why are we doing this? What, why are we doing this? Why are we laying out big goals? Why are we dreaming about the future? There's two reasons I just want to mention real quick. Number one, to whom much is given, much is required. God commands his children, his people, to be good stewards of all that God has given us. And God has blessed our church. God has given us so many unbelievable blessings and opportunities and incredible people. And it's our responsibility to continue to invest in his kingdom work and let him do what he wants to in building his church. And so this is all about being good stewards of all that God's given us. And number two, without faith, it is impossible to please him. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. I don't know how all of these things are going to happen and how they're going to take place. But I know that God is more than able. And I know that God wants us to live with unreasonable faith. And I know that when we pray the model prayer, it's not about my will, but it's about his kingdom coming, his will being done. And that's all I want to be a part of. I just want to be a part of God's kingdom work and what he's doing here and all around the world. And if we don't have faith, it's impossible to please God. And so that leads me to the title of our message. And before we do that, I just want to put in a plug. Some of you asked about this t-shirt right here. This is just our new t-shirt for the year. It's got our theme on it, Never Stop. We had our 50th anniversary t-shirts last year. We have our 51st year t-shirts this year, all right? Never Stop. Just the reminder all year long that the same faith that it took to build this church is the same faith that's required to uh, sustain this church and to continue to move us in the for into the future. And so if you want to get a t-shirt, you can go stop by the table in the back at the end of the service. All right, now. That brings me to our passage and the message that we have this morning, which is this, fight to the finish. I love that we just got done singing a fight song. I'm fighting a battle you've already won, but fight to the finish. We've arrived at the end of the book of Joshua. In verses 1 and 2 of chapter 23, we find out that Joshua is old and he's stricken in age. And I love what he says in verse 14. Joshua just calls it like it is. At the beginning of verse 14, he says this, And behold, this day I am going the way of all the earth. Joshua knows that death is knocking at his door. He's going the way of all the earth. If the Lord doesn't return, every single one of us one day are going to breathe our last breath. We're going to die. We're going to step into eternity. This is where Joshua is at. It's at the end of his life. He's about to die, but not until he gets his final say-so in <laughs> I love Joshua. You want to talk about never stop and fighting to the finish? That's what Joshua is doing here. He's got that, that never stop spirit is alive and well. And in chapters 23 and 24, he gives two different farewell addresses. And this morning, we're going to look at the first one in Joshua chapter 23. And essentially, all that he's telling his people that he has led faithfully for all these years is to never stop, fight till it's finished. Fight till you have run and completed your race and you have completed the course. And so that's what we're going to be looking at this morning. Number one, the first thing that I want us to see as we jump into our passage today is if we're going to fight to the finish, we have to refuse to lose. We have to refuse to lose. Look at verse one of chapter 23. It says this, 
And it came to pass, what's those next three words right there? A long time. All right, y'all got to help me out here. Okay, ready? Verse one. And it came to pass, those next three words, a long time after that the Lord had given rest unto Israel from all their enemies round about that Joshua waxed old and was stricken in age. Okay, so this had been a long time after the land had been distributed. We have fast forwarded it multiple years. Joshua's at the end of his life. The land had had rest for a long time. Now look at verse four. And it says this, Behold, I have divided unto you by lot these nations that remain to be an inheritance for your tribes from Jordan with all the nations that I have cut off even unto the great sea westward. Joshua is bringing his people together. And he's reiterating the fact that the Lord has given the land rest. It had been a long time before he cut off the nations that were there. But there were still nations that remained. Which, guess what that means? There were still enemies inside the land. There was still opposition that had to be faced. And I love this about Joshua. Here Joshua is. He's at the end of his life. He's about to breathe his last breath. You know what he's not doing? He's not feeling one bit sorry for himself. That's a great example of how we end our lives. He's not feeling sorry for himself. He's about to step into the presence of his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And you know what he's doing at the end of his life? He's burdened. He's passionate. He wants his people to understand the importance of fully possessing all that God had given to them. Don't stop until you possess all of your inheritance, all of your land. Go get it. And he's telling them some pretty incredible things. He's reminding them about what God has already done. The first thing he tells them is in verse 3. He says, And ye have seen all that the Lord your God hath done unto all these nations because of you. For the Lord your God is he that hath fought for you. Are you ready for a great truth this morning? God fights for you. God fights for you. God's fought for the nation of Israel. He tells them to go get the rest of the land that's remaining, and they don't have to be worried about the victory. God's already fought for them. God's already won the battle. They are victorious. They're on the winning side. They have the advantage, not because there's anything great about them, but because there's everything great about their God. This morning, we're on the winning side. I love that song that we just got done singing. I'm fighting a battle. You've already won, no matter what comes my way, I will overcome. Do you all believe that? We're at war, right? But he fights for us. He's already won the battle. We are victorious. We are victorious. And we have to live with that type of faith. And we have to live with that type of passion. God fights for you. And then look at verse 4. I've already read it. But he says, behold, I've divided unto you by lot these nations that remain to be an inheritance. The land's already yours. It's, I am going to fight for you, and I've already given you the land. So what does that mean? All that that means is they've got to get in the fight. They've got to not be apathetic. They can't just coast and go through the motions. They just can't get comfortable with their own little piece of land and their own little house. They've got to get in the fight. And if they get in the fight, God will fight for them and they will win the land because the land is already theirs. Now, before I get into the practical application of this, I want to ask a question that it comes up in my mind all the time. I'm sure it comes up in many of yours as well. But why the opposition? You know, why did God cut off the main enemy and enable them to go in and take over the land, but why didn't he just remove all the opposition? You ever wonder that? Anybody here ever wonder, like, why do we have to talk about fighting to the finish? Why can't we just say finish strong? Why does it have to be a fight? I don't like to fight. I'm tired of fighting. It's exhausting. Anybody ever get there? Let me ask you another question. Let me turn it back on you. Sometimes we wonder, like, why doesn't God just remove our problems and take care of it? He's able to do anything, right? Well, let me, let me ask you this question. Would it be wise for a billionaire to give his 18-year-old son or daughter, okay, an 18-year-old son or daughter, would it be wise for him to give him all of his inheritance and just turn his entire company over to that 18-year-old? Does anybody in here think that's a good idea? If you do, raise your hand. 
Nobody? Nobody thinks that's a wise idea. What do you think would be smart? What is he going to tell that child? He's going to tell that son or daughter, hey, if you want to possess all that we have, here's what you got to do. You got to go start all the way at the bottom. And you got to work your way up to the top. Get involved in the business. Go learn and see how it operates. Go learn and see how it functions. Get to know the people that are around you and grow and learn the business. And someday, if you prove yourself to be faithful, man, I'll give you all of it. Do you understand that God wants us to grow in grace? That's what it's all about. Man, if we never had to get to the point where we had to learn to fully trust God. We talk about Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Well, if we never were tested in those areas and we never had to really learn what it is like to release all that we have and all that we are and all that we love and all that we desire to be, if we don't have to take that to the cross and leave it there at the cross and put him and his will and his way above everything else, what would we be missing out on in life? We would be missing seeing God prove himself over and over and over again that he does exactly what he says. God wants us to grow in grace. And so he's left the enemy and he's left some opposition so that we'll actually put into practice. Yeah, you do fight for me. The land is already mine. <laughs> I just have to trust you and live with unreasonable faith. And that leads me to our practical application. Why the opposition? I mean, not why the opposition. Never stop driving. Never stop driving. Look at verse five. It says, and the Lord your God he shall, he shall expel them from, what's the next two words? Before you. And drive them out of, what's the next two words? Your sight. And ye shall possess their land as the Lord your God hath promised unto you. The answer is contained right here in this verse. The Lord is fighting. Okay, well, actually, let me go back to it. The Lord will expel them from before you. Okay, the Lord will drive them out of your sight. But if they're going to be before us, and if they're going to be in our sight, that again means that we are actively engaged in the battle. We are fighting the fight. And if we fight the fight, the Lord will drive them from before us. And so our responsibility is to drive and to never stop driving. Possess the land. Possess all that God wants us to experience and accomplish in this lifetime. All that he created us to do. We are at war. We are at war. We have an enemy. Last week we were having our education emphasis and we were talking about the next generation and how effective Satan is at fighting for the next generation and how he wants to steal and kill and destroy. Everything's at stake, right? We are at war. But I love the terminology that was found in verse 4 again. He's talking about there's still nations that remain, but I'll give them to you for your inheritance just like the other ones that I cut off. He cut them off from the land already. Now, I was thinking about our enemy, and the Bible refers to him as a serpent, right, as a snake. Anybody here like snakes? I despise snakes. I'm a big chicken when I say, if I run over a snake when I'm mowing my lawn, I scream and I run. I'll just admit it. I, those are things that creep me out. But also, when I go to a zoo, I can't help but just stare at them. They are like, I don't know, they're just, they're disgusting, all right? But anyway, I was thinking about snakes. And uh, I, did you know? that if you cut off the head of a snake, that that snake can still live for minutes, even hours, even though the rest of his body is decapitated from him. I was reading a story just this week. I'm going to gross you all out here this morning. A story just this week about a husband and a wife who were gardening. They were doing some yard work, and they came across a big rattlesnake, and the husband got a shovel, chopped off his head. And I kid you not, he went down there to pick up that head a little while later, and that head bit him and injected like all of the venom that he had left in him, that man needed 26 anti-venom shots to survive that snake bite. Now you might be sitting here wondering, what are we talking about? Guess what we're talking about? On the cross of Jesus Christ, what happened to the Satan, to Satan, to the serpent? He was destroyed. He's been crushed. The battle has already been won. He is absolutely powerless to stop us no matter what comes our way. We're overcomers. Do we believe that today? But he's still alive, right? And he still packs a powerful punch. 
But our attitude as Christians is to refuse to lose. Refuse to lose. We're victors. Not because there's anything great about us, but because there's everything great about Jesus. And we got to get in that fight and we got to drive. Every goal that's on this list that we handed out this morning is all about claiming the land that God's already given to us. And if we get comfortable and complacent, we're going to miss out on all that God wants to do. The book of Revelation, it talks about the seven churches. It talks about churches that become comfortable and complacent. And guess what God says? I'll remove your candlestick. I'll remove your light. Would to God that that would never be the case. Would to God that we'd have a church that's full of people, that are full of faith, that want to get in the fight, that want to be serving, that want to be building his kingdom, that want to go take over all the land that he has for us to possess, all of the people, all of his children that are created in his image, that he loves, that he went to a cross for, that we would do everything we can in our power to reach everybody that God wants us to reach for his honor and his glory. Refuse to lose Never stop driving, West Florida Baptist Church. Never stop driving. Secondly, we've got to embrace the process. We've got to embrace the process. Here's where the rubber really meets the road. I love this quote right here. If you want to see the super, you have to. Yeah, you all remember it. That one's stuck and ingrained in my head for forever. I'm probably going to remind you about it all the time, okay? If we want to see the super, you have to do the natural, We've got to do what we know is right to do. Sustained success requires discipline. Sustained success requires discipline. What are we talking about? We're talking about practice. Let Alan Iverson tell, Alan Iverson tell us what we're talking about this morning. Go ahead. Well, you know what separates the good from the great? Practice. And that's what we're talking about here. You've got to embrace the process Joshua's not going to leave this world until he reminds the people what they've got to do every single day if they want to have continued success in the land. By the way, before I get into that, let me just give you some good news. The process works. Look at verses 9 and 10. I love this. For the Lord hath driven out from before you great nations and strong. But as for you, everybody read this last verse. Read it out loud too like we mean it, all right? Let's just say the last phrase. But as for you... No man hath been able to stand before you unto this day. That's a champion right there. It gets even better, though. Look at verse 10. One man of you shall chase a thousand. For the Lord your God, he it is that fighteth for you as he hath promised you. Okay, no man can stand before you. One man is able to chase a thousand. You know what he's reminding them? You were once the underdogs. When you came into the promised land, nobody believed that you would win. Nobody believed that you were the champions. But yet, here you are. You are victorious. You are the champions. And if you're going to remain that way, if you're going to stay on top, you got to continue to do what you know is right to do every single day of your life. So are you ready? Here we go. Here's practical applications. Never stop obeying. Never stop obeying. Last week, we talked about obedience is the way. Does anybody remember the five action words that we gave you last week? Love, keep, walk, cleave, serve. All right, let's see how good you are. If you see if you're following along, let's go through those out loud together, okay? Number one was love. Number two, keep. Number three, number four, cleave. Number five, serve. You might be thinking, Pastor Mike, you did this last week. Why are we doing this again? Well, because it's in the Bible again. I'm not the one that's being repetitive here. God's being repetitive here. And if God's being repetitive here, there's some things that's got to get drilled into the very essence of who we are as people, into our DNA. Look at verse 6. He says, Be ye therefore very courageous to keep and to do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses. Keep his commandments. Everything, everything that's in here, everything that God says to do, everything that God doesn't say to do, keep it, obey it. This is the ticket to success in life. Look at how he ends that verse. That you turn not aside therefrom to the right hand or to the left. It doesn't say the word in here, but you know what he's talking about right there? Our walk. Okay, keep his commandments. Don't turn from the right or to the left. Walk in his ways. Do you know that the Bible uses the word walk 1,550 times? You know why? 
Because the direction that we're going determines our destiny. And if we walk in his ways, we don't turn our head to the right hand or to the left hand. We stay focused. Do you think we're going to end up being where God wants us to be? Absolutely. Then look at verse 8. But what's that next word right there? But cleave unto the Lord your God as you have done unto this day. Cleave. Desire God. Do you desire God more than you desire anything else? Do you desire God the same way that you desire water, the same way that you desire food, the same way that you desire comfort? Do we desire God? That's what cleaving is all about. It's just, it's desiring him. It's wanting him. It's wanting to be in his presence. It's wanting to be in his will. It's wanting to be wherever he is, wherever he's moving, wherever he's working. Cleave. And then verse 11, take good heed therefore unto yourselves that ye love the Lord your God. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. And guess what? Not in this passage, but in chapter 24, he's going to use the word serve 15 times. He's going out before he leaves. The last thing he says, choose you this day whom you will serve and serve the Lord with all of your heart and with all of your soul. Hey, if we want to be successful, if we want to see God help us to accomplish these goals and more and whatever he has in store for us, love the Lord your God, keep his commands, walk in his ways, cleave unto him, serve him with all of your heart. If you're looking for a five-step process to success, I promise you, if you get up and you live that way every day, you will end up being prosperous and successful in life. That is as, that's about as good as a simple key that you could ever get. Never stop obeying. But secondly, Joshua reiterates to his people, never stop separating. Never stop separating. Look at verse 7. That ye come not among these nations, these that remain among you, neither make mention of the name of their gods, nor cause to swear by them, neither serve them, nor bow yourselves unto them. You know what he's saying in this verse? Don't be friends with the world around you. Don't even mention the name of their gods. Don't swear by them. Don't serve them. Don't bow to them. He's commanding his people to be different. In verse 12, he goes on and he commands them not to marry these nations. And in verse 13, he says, Know for a certainty that the Lord your God will no more drive out any of these nations from before you. Go ahead and put that verse up there, verse 13. I want to show you some things in here. If they become friends with the world around them, if they start worshiping the gods of this world, if they start marrying and just blending in and becoming like everybody else around them, know for a certainty that the Lord will drive you out. He drove them in. He will drive them out just as easily and just as quickly. And then look what he says at the end of that. But they shall be snares and traps unto you and scourges in your sides and thorns in your eyes. Man, that's some pretty vivid terminology right there. Could you imagine taking a big old thorn and just putting it in your eye? Man, I can't even imagine the pain of that. No, for certainty. If you become like the world around you, you forget the whole reason and purpose for what I've created you for and what I've left you here in this world to do, which is to bring honor and glory to God. And by the world way, the world and their ways lead to death and destruction, and God's ways lead to life and blessing, and we want to live in life and blessing. So never stop separating. Don't be friends with the world. Don't mention their names. Don't bow to the gods of this world. Don't live for yourself. Don't live for money. Don't live for more vacations. Don't live for the weekend and just living it up and doing your own thing. Don't live for that. There's greater things to live for in life. Separate yourselves. You know what the Bible says in the New Testament? In 1 Peter, he tells us to be ye holy as I am holy. You know what the most basic definition of holiness is? I like to just bring it down and make it as simple as possible. The most basic definition of holiness is separate. When the, when, um, the seraphim are crying out in the book of Isaiah chapter 6, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. You know what they're saying? Separate, separate, separate. 
He's unlike anybody. He's unlike anything. We can't even describe him. There's not even a better word to describe how different and unique God is besides the word holy. He's unlike us in every way. And you know what God wants his children to be? He wants us to be separate. He wants us to be distinct. He wants us to stand out. And can I tell you this morning, embrace holiness because holiness is awesome. When was the last time you heard that in church? Man, sometimes we, we, we come down hard Live a holy life, and we feel like that's a hard and tough command. Can I tell you, holiness is the key to success. Holiness is awesome. Let it start in your home. God's not being harsher. He's just saying, when you get married, marry somebody else that loves the Lord their God with all of their heart, soul, mind, and strength. Don't marry a non-believer. Don't be unequally yoked, because inside of your home and inside of your marriage, if both of you are pursuing God above everything else, I promise you this, you'll have a good marriage, and you'll have a happy home. Don't sell out, and don't settle. Be holy. Be unlike everybody around you. Put God first, and pursue him above everything else. He calls us to be holy. Be separate. Clean your lives up. What does that mean? And to be separate about uh, the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace. Does our world have any joy? Does our world have any peace? No, self-control, meekness. I mean, I could go down, goodness, gentleness, Our world is in desperate need of people that are different. Clean it up. Live a holy life for God. Be everything that he created you to be. Be separate in the way that you love others. Be separate in the way that that we are committed to the mission and serving God. I'll turn it back around. Instead of living for the weekend about just getting away from work and going and living your best life, why don't you live for the weekend and how you can serve God and how you get to go to worship with his people and how you can be involved in what he's doing in this world for his honor and for his glory. Live for that. Look forward to those days. Just be different. God will bless holiness. He'll give you a great marriage. He'll give you a good name. He'll give you a clean conscience. He'll give you meaningful relationships. He'll give you satisfaction and fulfillment. You won't have to go to bed at night longing for the next weekend because this weekend didn't just quite fill it up. No, he will give you fullness of life. Be different. Never stop separating. And last but not least, and we're done. And by the way, before I go on with that, I'll come back to that. If we're going to accomplish these goals as a church, That's what it boils down to. Doing the natural, just be obedient and be different. Just live with joy and peace and love and gentleness and goodness. All of those, just be different. That's all we have to do. If we fight for it and if we embrace what God's called us to do, I guarantee you the light of Jesus will shine brightly. And if we lift high his name, he draws people to himself. Embrace the process. That's what it's all about. And last but not least, Know the sword. Know the sword. All right, look at verse 14. Here's Joshua's final words in chapter 23. And behold, this day I am going the way of all the earth. He's about to die. And ye know in all your hearts and in all your souls that not one thing hath failed of all the good things which the Lord your God spake concerning you. All are come to pass unto you, and not one thing thing hath failed thereof. What an incredible promise. I want to get to the end of my life and I want to be able to say that to my kids and to my family and to anybody that God's allowed me to have influence. Know that the Lord is good and not one thing has failed. All has come to pass. And not only all that, he's done exceeding abundantly above anything that I could ever ask or think. God is faithful. You know why he's setting it up with that? Because of what he's about to tell them in verse 15. No That God is faithful because guess what? The word of God is a two-edged sword. A two-edged sword. Look at verse 15. Therefore it shall come to pass that as all good things are come upon you which the Lord your God promised you. And by the way, why did all the good things come upon them that the Lord promised them? Because they obeyed, right? They went into the land. They trusted God. They obeyed all that he commanded them. And as a result, he blessed them. All right, so the sword, God's word, it works for you. When you obey it, it does exactly what he says it's going to do. But then look at the end of verse 15. So shall the Lord bring upon you all evil things 
until he have destroyed you from off this good land which the Lord your God hath given you. Know the sword. This is a two-edged sword. Most certainly when we obey and when we, when we meditate on it, when we know it, when we do, when we walk in his ways, when we obey his commandments, when we do all of that, this book will work for us and everything that God promises will come to pass. But know just as certainly that if we walk in our own ways and we do our own thing and we pursue what we think is best, this book will work against you. Just like God said. Just like God said. You could sit here and you could be like, well, that sounds like God is being a harsh God. He's not harsh. He's trying to protect us. The way, our way, leads to destruction. When lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, it bringeth forth death. You can see that all the way back in Genesis, and you can follow that all the way through, and you can still see it in real life living parables in front of you today by just looking at people that live for themselves and looking at people that live for God, and you will most assuredly see a difference. God's word will either work for you or it will work against you. Man, we are wise to consider the goodness of God and the severity of God because we forget either one of them to our own destruction. God wants to bless. God wants to destroy. Guess what? There's no middle ground. Choose you this day whom you're going to serve. Which side is it going to be? And here's the last application, and we are done. Never stop fighting. Never stop fighting. We're fighting to the finish, so we got to end this message with that last challenge. Never stop fighting. Can I tell you, West Florida Baptist Church, can I tell every single one of you as individuals today, fight the good fight. Fight the good fight. Don't be worn out. Don't be weary in well-doing. Don't let Satan discourage you. Don't let Satan get you down. God fights for you. The land is yours. Get in the fight. Get up every day and strive to be holy and strive to obey and strive to be different. Fight for your family. Fight for your neighbors. Fight for your community. Fight for Milton and Pace, Florida. Don't ever stop fighting. Fight for your children. Fight for the next generation. Fight to obey. Fight for God's blessings because he wants to pour them out on you. Fight to the finish. Fight the good fight. And then fight for the land. Fight for the land. Fight for everything that God has in store for you and your family. For our church. Fight for everything that God has in store for us as a church. Again, that's what this is all about. These are just, these are goals. These are things that we've been praying about. I've been praying about for months now, honestly. Just ways that we can just continue to move forward. Ways that we can see God continue to move and work. And every single one of them just boils down to the same thing. It's people. It's just pointing people to Jesus. Here, around the world. Get in the fight. Are you just going to remain where you're at? Are are we just going to maybe stay on the sidelines and be casual attenders that show up on Sunday? Or are we going to just be all in? And are we going to fight for everything that God has for us? Are we going to embrace the fact that he's called us to live differently? He's called us to live for things that have meaning and things that have value. And what better things to spend your money on than advancing the kingdom of God? What better things to spend your life on than, than witnessing and praying that other people would get saved and come to know Jesus? What better thing to do than to show up and to serve? You know, as a church, we, when we went to two services, we had a little saying, attend one, serve one. <laughs> Serve in a service, attend another service. Make these days all about reaching people for God's honor and God's glory. I'm telling you, you won't regret it. You'll go home feeling full and satisfied and a part of what God's doing and how he's moving and how he's working. Fight for the good land. Never stop. Every good thing that he promised will come to pass. I was joking around about Highway 2027. I mentioned it in there. I wasn't joking about it. I mentioned it in there. We had Highway 2021, and I was thinking back on Highway 2021, and I just remember a statement that I made in that video that, again, is etched in my mind. But if we do our part, God will give us a front row seat to seeing him do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. That's all it boils down to. And by the way, every goal that we had for Highway 2021 was exceeded and more. And I believe with all my heart in the next 10 years, we could sit and we could say the same thing. 
It might not go exactly as what we think, but I can promise you this, if we're living with unreasonable faith, we will see God do things that can only be attributed to him.